Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mokhobe. It's a privilege and an honor to join you once again on this wonderful show of ours, Mokhobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. It's always a privilege to bring in another guest. I have Mr. Tavonga Muchuchuti, who's going to talk about running a software development agency and the challenges associated with that. And uh, as usual, we want to bring you life-changing, energizing, information that can may have an impact in your life and for that reason i'm asking you please to subscribe because we also need your support please hit that subscribe button right, right away uh, welcome to the studio sir thank you very much uh, mr mohobe it's uh, quite an honor really um i think in our previous discussions we actually talked about how much of a legend i've uh, heard you are uh, you know <laughs> in the streets so being called here is quite an honor thank you very much that's really flattering but uh be kind enough to share your background, tell us your, a little bit about your academic history and so on. All right, so um, my initial background is in finance, mm -hmm. right? So um, I think I, f I finished school in 2019 as uh, the top of my class, uh, valedictorian um, of my year of completion. Um, I've also undergone the Yale Young African Scholars. I was the same. Oh, ah. <laughs> Valedictorian simply means giving that speech on behalf of the whole school, right? Yeah, but then also being the best student of the class as well. Yes, as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. basically it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and um, I've also gone through the experience of uh, being a young uh, Yale Young African Scholar, um, and in that as well, I'm also currently doing my executive MBA uh, with the University of Sheffield Hallam. Mm, that's that's great. Um, your s interest in software, how did that start? Um, I think I've always been a problem solver as an individual. Um, I've always been fascinated with seeing a problem and solving and fixing it. And I think the most scalable, most efficient way to solve problems, especially now, is using software. And so over the years, I started to analyze and, and see different situations with African companies and African entrepreneurs and how they were struggling to get access to financing. And that sparked my interest uh, in starting my very first startup in 2016, mm -hmm. when I think I was in my first year of university. It ultimately failed, uh, but I thought it was we were going to revolutionize um, the banking industry. Um, and in doing that, we basically had, I had basically had to learn uh, software development. I had to learn different languages for front end, back end. Mm -hmm. um, and in that experience, I then basically realized that we could solve even many more problems using these kinds of software. And, and software, is, is it, is it um, really like the opposite of hardware? Can you simplify it for us? All right, so it's not necessarily the opposite of hardware, right? So hardware needs something that gives it instructions of what to do and how to work. Mm. So for example, when you have your mouse and you click on a specific icon, mm. software basically tells um, the hard, it basically, it basically says the instruction that when somebody clicks this specific button, mm -hmm. then um, mm -hmm. it means that you should open this file and mm -hmm. give access to this. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the relationship between software and hardware. Okay. Yeah. And um, I can tell from your name, Chuchuti, uh -huh. that uh, you're from outside the country. Can you give us about, give us a, an idea of where you're from and how you wound up in, in BW? Yeah, so um, I am Zimbabwean mm -hmm. um, by uh, birth, and also my both my parents are from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came to Botswana in 2006 uh, when my, my father got an opportunity to work at uh, one of the companies here in Botswana, mm -hmm. and I haven't looked back since. Okay. Yeah. Talk, talk to us about your company, Xavier. I'm interested in the name, uh -huh. and uh, I want to understand how what it does. We'll get to the nuts and bolts, but talk, uh -huh. talk to us about the name first. The name. 
So, um, growing up, there's this movie I really loved. is the X-Men, right? As, as a young boy, you've got these superheroes that you look up to. And I really had this thing with Perfect Professor X, right? Professor Xavier. Mm. <laughs> and so as a result, um, when it came to us deciding on the name of a company that we wanted to have, um, it had to be, okay, what are we trying to be and what kind of value are we trying to provide? And the kind of value we're trying to provide is we were trying to become problem solvers. We were trying to be sort of the superhero mm. uh, for the, the companies locally. And so naturally, uh, Xavier Africa was uh, the name okay. that we came with. Uh, all right. Specifically, what problems are you solving? All right. So I think um, I, I could divide them into four. Four mm. main problems that we're currently solving as mm. a company. Yes. Um, and I think I'll just give a bit, bit of a background story into where it comes from. Right. So, look, I strongly believe that Africa is the foundation of innovation. Because you look at the foundational innovations that started our world. Look at the fire, for example. The first fire was made here in this continent. Mm. Uh, you look at the oldest paintings, they, were, they are found on our walls. Mm. You look at um, things like uh, the first equation, the first mathematical equation was solved in this continent of ours. Yes. And quite frankly, a the lot first of evidence, universities. Yeah, the first universities, um, mm. and even the fact that um, the very cradle of humanity is here you know, in Botswana uh, yeah. by uh, multiple evidence sources. Yeah. So it means that we've always had innovation within us. But, you know, we could blame colonialism or any of the issues that happened in between, but where were we when the first computer was made? You know, uh, mm. you know where were we when um, the first cameras were made? Um, where were we when, you know, the first light bulbs were made? And so, well, I've you know... I've read a book on, on black inventors saying uh -huh. that we are right in the thick of some of those things. That um, some, some African-American brothers were busy participating even the cell phone, light uh -huh. bulb, but you know, uh, some of that information is not readily available, but it's there. Yeah, but w which, is, which is true, right? But mm. at the end of the day, we look at ourselves as a continent, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, you exclude the diaspora. Yeah, we, well, not necessarily, but we, we want to look at the continent itself. Like, mm. what happened to us? Okay. Um, because even after imperialism, we still also failed to innovate. We were left out in the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, and with all evidence pointing right now, we might actually just lose out on the fourth mm -hmm. uh, to conferences and talking conventions. And so as a result, the most important thing now was how do we then come on to restore the African pride mm. by bringing on the innovation? Yes. And so we principally solve four problems. Mm. The first one mm. is by helping African enterprises become better, cheaper, and faster. Thus helping them become more efficient and also ensuring that their customer uh, service and you know, customer engagement is higher and much better. Mm. Uh, the second thing that we, d we were looking at in terms of problems is we've got this huge plaguing problem in our health system whereby there's so many people who are dying untimely deaths uh, because of you know, lack of monitoring or lack of resources. And that's the second big problem that we're looking at. The third thing is we've got an education system that's lagging behind that it can't seem to catch up. And it looks like even as we evolve to the next stage, our children are going to be left behind by the kids in other countries. Uh, the fourth thing is we've got these plaguing issues within our communities, your gender-based violence, mm -hmm. um, your uh, poverty in societies and non-sustainability of uh, programs. These are really the four main things that our core focus as a company is. Uh, are on and really uh, what brings the money to the table at the moment is digital transformation mm -hmm. and the rest of the other projects are things that we're doing in our own personal capacity sounds sounds like very uh, interesting interesting problems to tackle um, uh, tell us about when you graduated um, and then you formed Xavier what was the first focus tell us about that those initial baby steps uh-huh so the initial baby steps, the first thing that I actually, re we actually had to realize, so um, I've also got a, a co-founder, his name is Motel. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, the first thing that we realized is that we didn't have enough resources to do the ambitious things that we really want to do, right? So we had to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So initially when we started, we started off by offering, um, I don't know if you've entered into these things called chatbots. So, yeah. yeah, so basically when you go on, you know, WhatsApp or Facebook and you say hi, 
hello and then you're able to interact with it mm. and uh, you're able to do some specific business functions we were actually amongst the first companies uh, to introduce that into Botswana mm-hmm. so um, in using uh, a division of artificial intelligence called natural language processing we were able to provide that solution to multiple clients to start off mm-hmm. um, and when we started off with that uh, you know we started with uh, some tertiary uh, institutions uh, started off with some multi, some uh, not multinationals, some uh, parastatals as well. Uh, initially, starting off on a trial basis and burning through all our, you know, ca- initial capital from our savings. Mm. But eventually, as people started to know that these are the people who provide the solution, we started, you know, offering it at scale mm. uh, to multiple organizations. And uh, from there, really, the has the rest of the history. Yeah, and and and. You know, I, I'm going to be a bit uh, hesitant in asking you some of these questions because this is not my area, and I consider yeah. myself a, a novice in this area. Uh, if you're thinking in terms of someone in the rural areas, um, what interventions do you think your company can do, and in terms of bridging the digital divide and bring some of these? these uh, technologies, because you spoke of AI, AI you spoke yeah. of what, what, what can be done and what are you, are you involved in any effort to, to, uh, to assist rural communities? So um, that specific uh, problem is one of those that we've been looking at for a very long time. So mm-hmm. really the biggest problem with the rural areas is an infrastructure problem, right? Mm-hmm. So first of all, they need to be able to get access to internet, right? Um, for any meaningful applications really. Uh, there's the USSD technology, for example, where you do the star one, two, three hash, mm. and so on and so forth, and you're able to do things. Mm. But there's only so much you can be able to do with that kind of foundational technology. So really, it's a first of all, there's a big infrastructural um, commitment that needs to happen. And, at um, a political level. Yeah, pretty much at a, at a political level. But what we've been able to do for ourselves and understand is um, we need to be able to take different baby steps towards getting to serving those markets. Mm. So, for example, I can give a big example of um, one of our key products called Teladoc. Uh, it's basically um, a product for individuals with chronic illnesses for us to be able to monitor their health data in real time and then basically be able to report back to the doctor once How does uh, it work? things are happening. So, basically, we're using... Um, you are able to, to, to use that in rural areas. So, that's the plan, mm. right? But we need to also be realistic enough to find that we cannot be able to get to rural areas yet because they do not have access to internet. So for now, by being pragmatic, we're saying, okay, initially let's focus on individuals in the towns and cities we have access to money and access to Wi-Fi and internet uh, who really care about their health and want to be able to ensure that you know, their diabetes is kept in check. They want to ensure that their heart condition is kept in check. Um, and so we've just decided, okay, we'll start with those, and how then as we gain other, traction, how, how then we the keep going. How does product work? All right, so basically um, it's actually going under, undergoing regulatory uh, checks at the moment. Mm. But basically the way it works is um, it basically uses what we call IoT or Internet of Things. Um, so there's basically a wearable device, a wearable ring that an individual wears. Mm. Uh, this particular ring is connected to um, your phone, right? So basically uh, in this particular position, we're able to get all the different vitals of the individual. So using uh, different machine learning algorithms, we're able to then um, estimate what exactly is going on in in the individual's body and be able to identify red flags. Mm. So for example, if someone's um, temperature is constantly rising at maybe uh, 5.2% every minute or Mm. or something like that, we're able to raise a red flag uh, from our expert engine. So as a result, we're now able to um, then advise and say, okay, no, mm-hmm. there's a problem here that might be coming to avoid. Um, an Sounds very event. interesting. Is it proprietary yet? Um, it? Yeah, well, so we're still really working with regulators, mm. um, particularly in, uh, across the border, uh, mm. to make sure that we can be able to uh, take this and it's safe for, mm. for, for people. Mm. So that's uh, a big part of what we're doing. But we're re- we really freely discuss it because it's something very difficult to, to get done. Mm. What did you say are some of the, the initial challenges you, you experienced as a founder yeah. of a young, exciting business like this? Um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult um, starting something from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I say this all the time uh, to friends and family that building from zero to one is 
as a huge challenge, especially when you're coming from a background where there's no connections that you're basing from. Um, you're coming from uh, your first generation entrepreneur, for example, um, and you basically saving whatever money you have to be able to raise uh, to, to start a business. So I think the biggest problem for us initially, especially starting off, was a capital problem, right? Because we're trying to offer a highly specialized service. Mm -hmm. And highly specialized services means that we need highly technical individuals who are discuss skill all over mm -hmm. the world. Are so you're talking about, uh, you're talking about programmers? Yeah, so basically in, in our end, um, it would be, we've got, we need, we need engineers, mm -hmm. right? So we needed um, um, software, architect, uh, software architecture experts, uh, right? We needed individuals. Coders? Um, yeah, so that's a generic way of saying it, mm. but there's quite a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of um, uh, different fields within okay. that, if I can okay. say. But I think we can just say programmers um, were the biggest expenditure that we, we had to face. So, um we, we, I had to pivot multiple times um, to do things that I, I didn't want to do mm. in order for me to be able to raise capital to do can what you, can really you give an example yeah so one of the services that I, I really don't um, uh, what that we really um, I mean didn't want to do in yeah. initially mm. was um, websites for example um, uh, because we wanted to just solve big problems so initially we had to offer um, other services like uh, websites you know, in order for us to be able to raise money. Uh, and I even remember some time last year, uh, at the height of the COVID uh, pandemic, um, we're left with about three pula in the company account. Three bucks. Three bucks. <laughs> One, two, three. I mean, you can't even go to the ATM to go and withdraw that. Mm. Um, and it's, 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 it's almost payday. At the time, we we're about three, four employees. And on top of that, you've also got the rental. At the time, we, were, we had a small office in Fairgrounds. And... You know, initially you're in shock. You're like, you know, what am I going to do? But at the end of the day, you've got to save the situation. So I remember at the time I had to start a small tuition service where I was tutoring kids on math and science in order to be able to raise money to be able to pay my overheads of the business. So really, these are some of the sacrifices mm. that, you know, had to happen in order. So for is that us the advice you're giving here. other youngsters that be, be prepared to pivot and then come back? Don't just say, no, I'm good at this. I'll stick with what I, what I know. In yeah. other words, be prepared to, as it were, create alternative streams of income. Exactly. Mm. I, I think uh, even as an investor, you can be able to say that um, you wouldn't necessarily be comfortable giving a company that has no traction any money. Mm. Um, you want to be able to see proof of traction um, of the company. You want to see that, okay, these people have been able to get actual customers. Uh, these people actually have a product. Uh, these people actually have some sort of product market fit. Um, and so as a result, that particular period um, is a period that as an entrepreneur, you've just got to roll up your sleeves and mm. do whatever it takes to make sure that you can be able to get the money to get there. So you're able to get out of that three bucks ditch, so to speak. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what's the situation now? The situation is much better now. I mean, you, you, you can't say that everything is perfect you know, at any given point in time because you're trying to be a high growth uh, enterprise. Mm. So, for example, at the time, this is March 2020, we had about four employees. Now we have at about 14 wow. um, because we're constantly reinvesting every single cent that we're making in the company. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, because we were trying to grow fast and also trying to grow lean at the same time, there's a lot of capital that has to go into it. So um, every now and then there's that occasional uh, cash flow issue, but it's not one of those uh, three bucks situations that we, we had that we once experienced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, thinking in terms of um, uh, collaboration with other, other companies, I've, I've always believed in this show that collaboration is the way you cannot um, get very far with, without collaboration. Is it something that you are... Um, you are involved in is there something that you your company is involved in yeah so remember the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve are ambitious and huge mm. right and um it's some of them crazy mm. right <laughs> for instance? um for instance like the trying to solve the health uh, crisis yeah, issue yeah. like some of the education stuff that we're trying to build and so as a result um one of the one of the biggest collaborations that we currently have going on uh, is a product called ami 
Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so AME basically is a, a chatbot. Is that, is that an on acronym for something? No, no, no. It's just AME. Uh, mm-hmm. The idea was um, a simple name that anyone can relate to. Mm-hmm. So basically AME is a chatbot uh, hosted on WhatsApp that we built as a company mm-hmm. um, that helps gender-based violence survivors uh, get access to different services for counseling, different services for shelters, mm-hmm. different services um, for evidence gathering, because you know some fi- some survivors are not ready to report immediately, mm. but uh, what we are doing now is uh, working with uh, a large stream of clinics all over the country, as well as about nine seven NGOs at the moment, mm. um, to basically uh, pu- put the service and help you know people. And I think so far we launched around August September, and we've already helped about two hundred and fifty different individuals. Mm. Um, you know, either individuals who are in dire need of a solution now and can't go to the police uh, mm-hmm. because if they go to the police, uh, maybe there's the breadwinner you know, mm-hmm. in their family. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really, we found that collaboration is pretty big in being able to solve big problems. And really, if it had not been for just a few capacity issues, would have been able to help even more than 250 people in the, in the month we've wow. served that service. Okay. What about government input? Do you, are, you, are you seeking any assistance from government? either in terms of funding or some other? Um, I, I think our biggest thing is um, we, we like to, to first show uh, and not tell, mm. right? So I don't believe in business plans and, and all these different things. So you find that what we're trying to do now is we're trying to get to a point, um, which is what, something we're really fighting towards uh, in our five-year strategy now. Mm. We're trying to get to a point whereby we have solved multiple problems at a basic level. Mm-hmm. And now we need to be able to get funds to scale uh, this particular uh, problem, I mean, uh, solution. Yeah. And so as a result, at the moment, we, are, we have not currently been seeking any uh, outside investment or um, any government assistance. Would you be interested in angel investing? I'm, I'm speaking here uh-huh. as uh, we're in the head of angel network, but one. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. There are a couple of, a couple of um, companies in the e-commerce space and in the, um, you know, the IT space that we, we've assisted. So I uh-huh. don't know whether you have any interest. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 interest, is, is, is the is interest is definitely there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the, again, I go back to how audacious some of our um, <laughs> plans are. Mm-hmm. So, for example, e-commerce is proven, right? Mm-hmm. E-commerce is an Amazon. They've done it before and we've seen the blueprint. Mm. Um, and it's a pretty simple solution to get out. Now it is. Yeah, now, mm. you know, you know mm. what I, especially now, mm. you know. But when you look at, for example, the Teladoc product I was talking about right now, this IoT product, mm. um, first of all, investors are not sure, is it actually going to work, right? Because we've got the regulatory barrier so of still the medical sector. Stage. Yeah, so we're still really in experimental stage, stage. And we still really at a stage where we want to say, okay, fine, these are technologies we've used before and we know they work, but we need to first get validation of regulators and other medical practitioners. Proof um, of concept. Yeah, proof of concept, really, yeah, yeah. Mm. So once we prove that the concept works, and once we have some customers mm. to show that, no, this is actually brings value, then you know, we'll definitely come running. Okay, Yeah. Right. no, you, you'll give me a call. <laughs> definitely. Apart from the product you just mentioned, what other significant achievements are you proud of at Xavier? Um, I think, we just we just do so many really great work, you know, at Xavier Africa. Mm. Um, I mean, like for example, this morning I just heard that um, uh, part of our team is going to be joining a, a World Bank delegation to um, give direction on how to use uh, technology to be able to do societal good. Um, it's something that I, I mean, it's a fresh mm. fresh one. Mm. But I think one of the biggest highlights in my career was um, some time last year. We worked with a large um, agricultural um, distribution company mm-hmm. that uh, provides different inputs. So this company operates in, uh, from South Africa. And basically, they, they had all these different farmers that they, were curr- they currently had as their clientele. Um, and all these farmers would buy inputs from them. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, a lot of the farmers would lose their yield. And uh, you'd find ridiculous numbers, just like 25% 
only 25% of the total uh, farmland that's been plowed mm. actually brought something out. Mm. And 75% you know, goes to 75 waste. Goes to waste. Mm. And so these, this company had actually tried uh, you know, getting agronomists to come and go and visit these individuals individually, and that, but it's, it wasn't scalable. Mm. So we actually did some, uh, firstly we did uh, some consulting work for them. Um, and fr the resultant of that was a mobile application that we called the Farmer's Companion. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Farmer's Companion basically was once an individual uh, comes in and joins as a customer, basically the mobile application would have a walkthrough of the whole process, mm -hmm. right? So for example, for a chicken farmer, from the time they buy 100 chicks, they, it then calculates how many starters do you need? How many growers do you need? And then from there it will tell you, for you to be able to have healthy chickens, you need to be able to fit them 200 grams of this particular thing at this particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, the water has to be at this particular space at this particular time. So at the end of the day, so you know... all that is in the app? Yeah, all that is in the app. So the farmer only has to do is to press a button and, and ask, ask a question or how does it work? Not necessarily. So basically when you set up as a farmer, you put it and you say, okay, fine, I just got 100 chicks, for example. Once you put 100 chicks in, it basically does all the calculations automatically to say what exactly needs to happen. And then creates a custom calendar of events that need to be done throughout mm -hmm. and then also checks your inventory for example uh, for reorder if you want automatic reorders you know mm -hmm. it, it does all that for you so it's, it's it's really something that was I was really proud of because after we did that mm -hmm. in only about three to four months we started to see so many farmers start to move from only 25% success to about 45 so percent you know immediate innovation. validation yeah, immediate validation and mm -hmm. as more and more farmers are starting to get used to it i mean we've got reports now that uh, the average now um of individuals using the app of uh, success is about 60 percent that's huge so for me i'm looking at that and i'm saying these are these are these are farmers who normally didn't get anything from their labor and mm. now they're finally getting something mm. and that's why i do what i do mm. that's why you know the xavier team does what we, what we do wow sounds very 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 exciting yeah um, now, is it my is it my impression is that uh, an entity or a company just comes to you and say, look, here are the challenges that we have, here are our shortcomings, and then you design a software-based solution, whether that takes the form of a website or or an app. Uh huh. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Am I getting it right? Pretty much, yes. Okay. That's pretty much how it works. Mm. So an entity will, will tip, well, we are aggressive, so we go to them. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so we've got a team of guys whose job is just to, uh, business analysts, whose job is to look at different companies across the board mm. and basically go on and say, okay, from the outside, this is what we see mm. and this is what you need. So once we go into an organization, once we've been appointed, Typically what we'll do is that um, we go and do what we call a diagnostic meeting. Um, and then once we do a diagnostic meeting, we have a basic one pager of what's going on in the organization, what are the pain points. And then after that, for um, long-term contracts and long-term projects, sometimes you can even have somebody go work at that particular organization for a month mm. to try and understand, okay, what's going on mm. across the organization? Once we know that, then we're able to understand, okay, since these are all the different processes, what needs to be changed? Um, how do we optimize the processes? How do we ensure that um, customer satisfaction is improved? How do we make sure that the customer journey is shortened? Or how do we make it more pleasing for the customer? Mm. So we have multiple brainstorming meetings in boardrooms with you know, these companies to say, okay, fine, how do we get to the sweet spot? So with the intention of digitizing You're the core business. looking for the sweet spot. Yeah. So we're looking for the sweet spot of, okay, how do we increase efficiency without compromising customer, customer experience? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it, it happens that if you're trying to be too efficient, the customer is not following through and they're like, ah, this is too much. Mm -hmm. So we then basically then say, okay, fine. And two things. How do we digitize the core business? We digitize the core business. How do we find new growth opportunities? For example, this mobile application is a new growth opportunity that we gave uh, the, that uh, agricultural firm. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, the, on the other side, the digitizing the core um, uh, feature, uh, the core business, it's what we do in a lot of parastatals, mm -hmm. whereby they have these long queues on a daily basis. We don't necessarily reinvent the wheel. We basically say, okay, fine. How do we shorten the approval process and the whole process mm. to optimize and make with it much better? Without compromising on quality. Yeah, without compromising on quality as well. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much pretty okay. much what we do. I've heard people talking about the eighty twenty rule. Say, look, uh -huh. it's really eighty 
eighty percent of what you do brings in twenty percent of result and vice versa. Yeah. Do you ever factor the eighty twenty yeah. rule in your in your in your algorithms and your manner in which you do things? Yeah, so basically the, the Pareto analysis, but Pareto analysis. Pareto, yeah, Pareto yeah. principle. Yeah, the Pareto principle. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's it's actually at the foundation of, of what we do. Because the core of inefficiency is when you find yourself as an organization um, focusing too much on what does not bring you value. Mm. So what we do is we define what the 20% of that value is. Mm. And then basically look at, okay, fine, how do we do the 80% that can influence this 20% mm -hmm. to ensure that everything is perfect there? Mm -hmm. And then from there, we work it backwards uh, to, to be able Reverse to ensure engineer. we... We, yeah, we basically reverse engineer the process. Wow. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. I'm, I'm really liking this. It's, it's really, really, really interesting. Um, is there anything that is out there that we haven't talked about that you're currently working on that really brings that spark, that brings you, it keeps you out up at night, really excites you? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't sleep much, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, because, I mean, there's quite a lot of, yeah. of, of you know, projects that we're doing um, and we're always doing because, again, we're experimental, right? We try, see if it, it's working. If it's yeah, not but working, which one makes talking. you giddy, makes you childlike, makes you uh -huh. excited at the moment? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that Teladoc product is, is, is up there, mm -hmm. you know, with, with uh, the creation of the mall because we're combining technologies that and saving even lives yeah that's saving lives yeah and this is the stuff that companies in silicon valley are also trying to figure out now mm. you know and being able to be toe to toe with, with with the guys that we've looked up to all our lives is something that we we definitely definitely are, are super excited when about. i listen to you i I get, I get a sense of hope and optimism that maybe we started bridging that digital divide what do you think well there's a lot of work to be done Mm. Um, I mean, look, I'm, I'm super excited actually with the smart bots initiatives being done by the Botswana government mm. to digitize um, government uh, operations. Um, I think. How far are we with that? It's, it's, it's still pretty. Um, we're still at some very. Because um, we're good at talking. We've just begun. But no, we're actually really implementing you oh, know, this time around. Mm. Um, because the kind of infrastructure that's being built at the moment with the smart bots initiative. Um, you know, I think uh, I was actually talking to, to the organize to the individuals responsible and the kind of services that are being built is such that We're going to have all these different government services built and fully functional using best practices You know in very few, in, in a very short period of time. I think five mm. to ten years. We'll have the full How much time have we given there. ourselves? Um, I think I think five to ten years. Okay, and yeah. how far are we in percentage terms? In percentage terms, the program started, I think, this year, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, I don't have the final, final details, oh, okay. but there are actually some services of government that are, have already been automated and have already started working. Yeah. Because instead of I one SIPA, big project... does that and uh -huh. URS does a lot uh -huh. of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you see, uh, instead of like a one huge government system, they've done something very fascinating called the microservices uh, uh, arrangement. So basically, one big architecture and then small little microservices that are being built at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you don't have to wait s five, six years for the full thing to be built. You only have one module, you can test it out, and you know it, it's working and serving people mm -hmm. whilst you're building on it. And that is one way to actually make sure that um, digital transformation works for you. Okay, all right. And, and are you doing work with government at the moment, your, your organization? Um, mostly parastatals. Okay. Yeah. Mostly parastatals. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, what are you doing with them? Um, it's it's, it's, a, it's a lot of different uh, work, really. If I if I can say, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is in our digital transformation space. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, um, our president is pretty am ambitious in how he wants to digitize the country, and so the parastatals as well are now also saying, how do you also tap into, the, into this digitization? Mm -hmm. And um, because we're experts in the digital transformation field, we're now basically, first of all, starting off by advising them and giving them uh, consultancy on how exactly they can create a digital transformation strategy for themselves. Mm. Um, and then going on to implement some of these services for them. Uh, I mean, we've seen multiple uh, parastators we've worked with in the past where we've helped them uh, reduce lead times by up to 50, 60%. Um, you know, just by implementing a very simple software solution. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, it's part of that stuff that yeah. uh, keeps us... For someone excited. who might be skeptical or a bit reluctant to 
thinking that this is all mumbo jumbo. Uh huh. What would you um, use as an example to illustrate that we've moved company X from position A to position B uh -huh. to, to sort of break it down and show the advantage of really looking for software solutions in a demonstrable way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I really want you to, to find examples that you, people can relate to in, 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 in making this point. Okay. So let me just uh, give a, a, a simple uh, analogy of a company that we recently uh, finished work with. Mm. Um, okay, so this is basically a large manufacturing company, right? So this large manufacturing company, they had um, multiple problems, right? Number one, it was just taking way too long uh, to create products, right? So the production line itself, it was moving way too slow. Number two, um, they had a quality management problem. Um, because you know it's they had humans doing all the quality management. Mm. Right, number three, they had a revenue loss problem, obviously due to you know these two main core problems on the production line. So the first thing that we did for them was um, we then said, okay, in the next five to ten years, what are your competitors going to be um, using to find an edge to create products faster and cheaper? Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, fine. It need, we need to have an automation strategy. So we need to automate the whole full production line to ensure that everything is happening 24 seven and it's all standardized and all the same. Mm -hmm. So that's when we basically said, okay, fine. The first thing we're doing is we're going to automate the full production line. So in automating the full production line, that means that these are people's jobs that are gone overnight, mm -hmm. right? And with the advent of artificial intelligence, it's even worse because these are not just robots that are just moving this from here to here. These are robots that now can be able to see and say, okay, fine, no, this is not of the right quality, so it should go to the other bin. Almost semi-human. You know, <laughs> almost semi-human, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, but don't get me wrong, mm. artificial intelligence is not there, there, there yet mm. because uh, on occasional cases, the humans will then ch check and see, okay, fine, there's a small defect here and there. But the good thing about AI is it trains itself. Mm. Right? So, in addition to that, yeah, it's self corrects over time. So, in addition to that, um, once we automated that full production line, that basically meant that both the initial problems disappeared mm. overnight mm. for that particular company. Um, and really, uh, initially we thought it was just about the technology, but the people, the people that had just lost their, were about to lose their jobs. They're trying to resist. They're trying to fight. Uh, against this particular technology. So we had to now go and retrain them. So um, what we did is that we uh, set up boot camps within the organization mm -hmm. to train these people on what are the new skills they need to be able to coexist with the robots. Mm -hmm. So now these people who would just have to just have a job of moving this to this mm -hmm. now had more complex and more interesting jobs that brought more value to the organization. Like and right. Like um, so, for example, um, some of the individuals uh, who were on the production line, we started training them on how to help um, feed new information to the AI. Mm -hmm. um, because AI thrives on data. So, okay, so how do we make sure that the data is aligning? So, um, we trained them on, on those different types of things. We tra trained them on uh, design thinking, for example. Mm -hmm. On, okay, fine, you're on the production line, you're on the ground. How, are you also, how, do, you, how do we capacitate you with the skills to be able to also solve problems within the production line as it is to make it better. Mm. So that's, that's pretty much um, that's you know, the kind impressive. of value mm. that we've been able to bring to organizations. And, and what impact did that have on the bottom line? Um, I think it's, it's a bit too early to tell, mm. right? Because it was a pretty big investment mm. uh, that the organization made. Mm. But um, one thing I can say in the six months to date uh, from the results that we were looking at previously with them, um, they've basically reduced their total costs of uh, manufacturing by, I think, about 12.5%. Uh, mm -hmm. It sounds like a very small amount, but we're talking about millions mm. of rands yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So it means that you know, there's, there's a huge savings that they're making. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, um, they've been able to insu ensure that their lead times from the time that something is from the beginning of the manufacturing to mm. the end, um, it's basically been reduced by 50%. Mm -hmm. So they're making products 50% faster than before. So um, we trust that, you know, because we've solved these core problems that we had in the, in the initial stages and quality as well uh, as a quality assurance, we're now looking at whereby we'd reject about 20% uh, to 25% of products at the end of the production line. We're now rejecting about 2%. Wow. 
So, you know, the savings are pretty big, mm -hmm. you know, from um, uh, this perspective. And as a result, we're going to see the savings uh, exponentially increase as mm -hmm. the time goes on because as an organization, they'll get better at adopting the technology. They'll move their full operations towards it. And uh, it's definitely something that uh, we see coming. Uh, and not only coming, it's already happening. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you can help me settle this uh, debate. I think uh, th it went viral initially. It was between Jack Ma and Elon Musk. Uh -huh. And I think Elon Musk was trying to say that AI is being taken too lightly. Uh -huh. And, and I, I think, I think uh, Jack Ma was very dismissive, although some people felt that Jack Ma didn't grasp what Elon Musk was trying to say. Mm. Uh, but Elon Musk's argument is that AI is, is very can be potentially dangerous if we don't watch it. What is your view? What are the dangers of AI? And how can we counteract those? First of all, can you just dip into that debate? And, yeah. and see, I want to hear what you think about this. OK, so I'm a, I'm a big Elon fan. So yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit skewed. You know, we know um, this discussion yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, I actually know the discussion. I actually watched it. And yeah, I was yeah. like, you know what? Elon is making a lot of sense. And yeah, it looks yeah. like Jack Ma is not too sure about what he's talking about. Yeah. But OK, let me just give a, a brief explanation of how AI works. Yes. Right? OK, so um, AI works on data. Right? So you basically, um, and you're trying to simulate a particular human um, intelligence to do something, to execute a task. So for example, um, what will happen is, um, I'll just give a quick example of um, a large bank in, in the US and how they did it. So basically, they have all this data about all the different clients that they have. So they throw it into the AI black box. It's a black box because nobody actually knows what factors it's considering. So as a result, uh, this large bank found itself um, with lawsuits whereby black people were being charged higher interest rates than white people because the AI found that from the data set, black people generally default more than white people. <laughs> and so the bank themselves legitimately didn't know this mm. because the AI is a black box. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, once you make a couple of models and you've got a couple hundred thousand um, data sets, you don't know what factors it will consider. Because it, it, it feeds on itself and analyzes yes. for itself what it sees. Exactly. Without the human touch. Exactly. Mm. So now, the biggest problem, right? Um, you look at one of my favorite companies in the world called DeepMind. Um, DeepMind, basically, uh, there's this famous Chinese game mm. that um, is based on intuition and skill. Um, that uh, DeepMind managed to beat a human on that. Mm. Previously, AI hasn't been able to do something like that. But because of better processing power and processing speed, mm -hmm. it was now able to do something like that. It did the same with chess. It took for a long time to beat a human. Exactly. Chess, but now it does that effortlessly. Yeah. ABM Watson, I think this is 1998. Mm. You know? No, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you can imagine, as AI continues to progress and becomes smarter and smarter, as well as um, you know, more optimal, mm -hmm. I mean, what's to say that one day AI realizes that humans are potentially destructive to the environment, which we are, mm. and finds that the most logical thing to do is to destroy the humankind. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really the worst case scenario. Did you watch but the, the movie Black with, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor, Will Smith, uh -huh. um, where ro I, ro I robot. Where yeah, basically I I robots, one, yeah, yeah, AI got to a point when uh, the robots tend on humans and it is it just, you know how uh -huh. Hollywood, yeah, how Hollywood does it. <laughs> so the diction. Yeah, look, look out for iRobot mm. with, with Will Smith. Yeah, mm. but it's, to be honest with you, it's, well, AI is not there yet now. Mm. That's a big fact that I want to share today. It's what we call general AI. Mm. Basically an AI that is all encompassing, that is super smart, that can do everything. Mm. We're not there yet, uh, technologically. But with the kinds of advancements that we're making and the exponential growth, that we're getting to, right? We don't know what inputs AI is going to take yeah. and how it's going to interpret different situations as it becomes smarter and smarter. Because I mean, humans are destructive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we need to be very honest about that. Yeah. We litter on the ground, we destroy the environment. Mm. What happens now if the AI then but says- we have the ability to you say, know, no, enough is enough. Let's uh -huh. put legislation, let's stop this. This thing about humans over the years is that They've always stopped themselves on the verge uh -huh. of self-destruction. Yeah, true. But now you're, you're capacitating a supercomputer to be able to then 
make a decision for itself. Mm. Um, so it's very, very, very critical that we set standards as a world mm. uh, to ensure that AI does not become too destructive. Okay. Uh, because the potential is there. So yeah, what's, what's Elon's take and what's your take based on Elon's take on this? Yeah, so my take is that if we're not careful, right, the AI black box will be destructive towards humankind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what we need to do is uh, we need to ensure that we regulate, um, well, not completely, but regulate mm-hmm. how AI is implemented and how it works. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've already got um, different countries using... Um, convolutional neural networks and computer vision. Say that again? Convolutional neural networks and computer vision. Uh, you might as well be speaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll make sense. It'll make sense. Yeah. It'll make sense. To basically uh, target individuals to kill. Mm. So basically it'll be a small drone, right? It's trained to mm. understand that Mr. Mohobe looks exactly like this with thousands of images of Mr. Mohobe. Yeah. Right? And then basically it'll just go around town looking for Mr. Mohobe. Mm. And once it detects his face, mm. and it says, target found, shoot. Mm. And at the end of the day, you know, what can happen with that kind of technology? Because that's the kind of technology we have at our disposal. What people can do with that kind of technology is potentially destructive. Mm. You know, because the same facial recognition that you use to check into your company, mm. that a drone can be able to use it to identify a potential target to kill. So you won't need uh, you won't need baby face than assassins anymore. Y- you won't. You're not gonna need that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna need that anymore. Yeah. It's it's a reality. Yeah. You know, it's a reality. Yeah. yeah. And maybe who knows? It's already been used in some quarters. Nobody mm. knows. So what is your your vision now? I'm going to ask you the vision question. What does your crystal ball tell you about Xavier? If you're projecting uh, ten years, twenty years down the line. What's 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 going to be Mr. Tavanga Machuchu be doing with Xavier? Yeah. 10, 20 years from now. Um, I think the, the the biggest element of our vision is um, we want to to do what um the company behind Moderna ended up becoming. Right. Moderna. The Moderna the vaccine. The, the vaccine, vaccine yeah. company. Yeah. Um. Tell we, me about we, that. What what happened? So basically, they were part of a larger company mm-hmm. that incubated um and started up different biotechnology startups within it. So it was like, a, instead of like a normal incubator where you invite startups from outside, they mm-hmm. had internal processes and systems that were churning out startups from internally. Mm-hmm. So um, that way, Moderna was part of some of the technology that they were currently experimenting with internally. And it turned out to be the company that came up with the MNRA um, sample okay. that pretty much has defined the, the coronavirus vaccine as we know it today. Mm-hmm. So in 10, 20 years, that's the kind of organization that we want to see ourselves as. Mm-hmm. In problem solving, mm-hmm. um, particularly particularly um, contemporary African problems, mm-hmm. uh, especially in these particular fields of digital transformation, number one, we don't want to be left behind. Number two, education and making sure that the education we provide our kids is education that will make sure that they are competitive in the world. Mm. Number three, edu- uh, health. Ensuring that these deaths that we keep seeing that could have been avoidable, are avoidable actually, deaths, you know, yeah, yeah they, they, we, we've eliminated them completely. Mm. Uh, and number four, these lurking problems in our communities that we've caused on our own, like gender-based violence, mm. that we've completely eliminated them. Uh, these are... Uh, the you think GBV yeah, can be eliminated through technology or through... Uh, through software? Well, it, I, have an, I have a hypothesis. It's not proven. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's something that I really want to try. Yeah. Right? Um, so I basically... Mean, how does it work? Right? Mm. So the hypothesis that, that, I, that I currently have, that we currently are trying to test out is uh, basically the, the way the human mind works is it's, pro- it's basically programmed in certain ways. Right? And this is based on your past experiences, your outlook on life, um, your um, whether you're left brained or right brained, and all these different intricate parts of the brain and how they work, and so as a one of the long term projects that we want to actually go on and take on, we believe that it won't remove gender based violence completely, but we'll reduce it. But we want to be able to use artificial intelligence to identify what the common patterns in perpetrators are. Once you find these common patterns in perpetrators, then we basically create predictive models 
to use in schools when kids are still young to be able to identify potential perpetrators. I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, but there's well, an ethical it line. Sounds, it's, 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 it makes sense. Yeah. So once we do that, right, um, then we want to be able to then say, okay, fine, these kids, whilst they're still young, because science says that when the kid is still young, I mean, before uh, high school and so on, you're able to change the course of you know their, their life to yeah. some extent mm. and so being able to then have um individuals to offer psychosocial support to these individuals at the stage to ensure that their mind frame and how they think of women and how they think of life completely changes mm-hmm. I, I i i personally think that's the logical you know way to do it and yeah. because of ai we're able to process millions and millions of data you know, uh, and actually find these common patterns without really... The ethics you're worried about are what? The possibility <laughs> that the parents could riot or even the kids would would feel uh, targeted or, or victimized. Yes. You say you need to attend this you know, a, a, Exactly, exactly. Mm. It's, it's something that... It's a, it's a thin line that we've been trying to mm. <laughs> yeah. um, figure out because yeah. we're like, okay, so if, say for example, we identify a kid, right, and we see the AI say that there's a 92.5 percent likelihood you will become a rapist. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, for uh, sake. You know, yeah. for argument's sake, how yeah. how are you gonna tell the parents that you know we think your kid is going to be a rapist in the future? If, if you don't act you now. know, if you don't act now, or even the kid themselves, how do we make sure that they do not become um, isolated by the other kids? That you know, you know, this one is going to become a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's so that's that's where you know it becomes yeah. very very, very you tricky have to, to find implement that. Very nice way of intervening. With yeah. That. yeah. So th- that's where now we're looking at partnerships with uh, people in the social sciences. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're really building a a very really interesting team uh, yeah. to do that. What about the presence of Xavier in other other you know markets, other countries? Uh huh. Is, um, is that in the picture? Yes, it definitely is. So, mm-hmm. for example, right now we're currently operating in three countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're currently operating here in Botswana, yes. uh, where our headquarters is. Uh, what we have some operations in Zimbabwe mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. um, and also South Africa. And you've had a lot of clients in South Africa, from what you mentioned. Well, not yeah. not really a lot, lot, but I think the the most significant uh, projects that we've been able to do have been, you know, from across the border. Because mm-hmm. you can imagine, with more with a larger population, yeah. there is also bigger problems to solve. Yeah. Yeah. So you are you going to take advantage of Akftad and go even more continental? Well, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm still trying to understand how exactly we're going to make that work. Mm. Uh, I think that's a dis- big discussion you know, for, for another day because, I mean, there's, there's a lot of structural problems in our continent that we need to fix before we can automatically say overnight that we're going to have free trade. Mm. And um, we want to be part of the solution, mm. you know, of being able to smoothen up all these different problems uh, across the board. But it's definitely something that we're looking at in the five yeah. to ten year horizon of our business. Yeah. All right. Um, one last question before you get to ask me a question. Uh-huh. Discipline. How, how important has discipline been in your journey so far? Because this is something that I've, we keep talking about endlessly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's difficult. I, I, think, I, I think I'm going to start from there. Right. So um, just going to dip into my background a little uh, without trying to be yeah, prideful or whatever um i grew up as a very as a pretty smart kid right so if i studied for 34 for 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 for, for 10 hours a day right i knew that i'm gonna pass mm. right i'd get the the math you know the physics the business studies the accounting and you know and get all these marks so i knew that input if i input x i'm going to get y mm-hmm. you know if i study this much i'm gonna get this much and that was me in school. And in the end, I got the valedictorian because of that, you know, model. Mm-hmm. But when you get into entrepreneurship... Well, yeah, and you got Kama, Kama Kum, Kum Lade. Summa Kum Lade, yes. Summa, summa Kum Lade. Yes, yes. In I, Yale, right? Um, no, no, this is at uh, Sheffield Hallam University. But it's connected to Yale. So. Um, no, Yale, that was a different program. Oh, uh, I see. The, the, the Yale one, yes. I came across Yale and I wanted um, your involvement with Yale. The, the Yale was actually a, a program, the Young uh, African Scholars Program, that uh, they take some of the most exceptional kids from around the continent mm-hmm. um, and then basically take them through multiple boot camp um, uh, programs. Yes. So, yeah, it's one of those uh, where I can say, you know, I'm world class. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, where they chose only about 50 uh, kids across the continent and we went to different programs with Yale. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but, so but it, you can conclude your point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so in concluding my point, really, uh, coming from that background where, you know, if you put in this, you get this. Mm. Going into tr- entrepreneurship, I mean, one of our first projects, we worked about 20 hours a day for um, two months and we didn't get paid. Right, <laughs> zero. So zero. They, they, they. Yeah, they basically did the thing that you know you, you don't read in business textbooks mm. that you know a company will take your solution and not pay you. Mm. Coming from that, and being able to go back to work tomorrow morning, <laughs> mm. it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's it's Just insanely it. difficult. Mm. And as an entrepreneur, um. Because, well, when you when you were in, in school and you're getting all these accolades and these grades, it was easy to, well, no, it was not easy to stay disciplined, motivated. Yeah. But you knew that, I mean, up to you, you get the something. feedback. Yeah, almost you get the immediate. feedback yeah. almost immediately. Exactly. And, you know, people clap for you at the prize giving ceremony. And, you know, you know, you get all these awards and your parents are happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an entrepreneur, no one is clapping for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so. If anything, they're booing you. Yeah, if anything, <laughs> they're just, they're, I'm just yeah, and, you know, yeah. it's, it's actually a fact. Yeah, you yeah. know, we've had multiple people throw spanners. Yeah. You know, just, just because. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. and you're like, but we thought that you would support us because mm. we're trying to do really good work. Mm. And so, staying disciplined um, has been very difficult. Mm-hmm. And really, it comes down to how big the mission and the vision is. And um, because a lot of the big bets that we're making. Um, are pretty big and ambitious, mm-hmm. really. Um, we could have easily just run maybe the digital transformation business, made a lot of money, and run around the city. Mm-hmm. But in adding all these different other businesses of experiments we want to really take to the market, mm-hmm. it made things exponentially harder. But it's because our vision and mission was to solve contemporary yeah. African problems. I think Elon said something to the effect that we must do it if it's important enough regardless of the prospects of success True. words to that effect yeah yeah that's, even that's if, basically even if failure is, is possible you mm-hmm. must do it nevertheless if it's important exactly yeah. so that's that's pretty much uh, the, our um our model of okay. thinking yeah. the chance to ask me a question sir um I, I think you know the the question um the biggest question really is so one of the i'm, I'm going to speak from my experience mm. Right. Um, I'm running one enterprise, <laughs> right? Mm. And With we're multiple. trying. Yeah, and multiple, you know, sub yeah, industries, yeah. if I can say. Yeah. And really keeping all these different base, all these different things um, managed properly is very difficult. And I really wanted to ask because you, you run quite a wide um, mm. range of you know, organizations. Um, how do you put in systems and processes in place that? help you uh, be able to manage all these whilst you're not there and also ensure that um, excellence is pursued mm. you know you know throughout yeah it's, it's an important question I mean and, and for me it's, it's really a work in progress I've been lucky in getting some very very uh, good people I mean for instance in our you know property business we have operations very people at the operations level collections level HR and then you have uh, people in maintenance. So I've been fortunate that people that I've been with from the 90s, for mm. instance, uh, one of uh, two of our oldest employees are from 1995. Ooh. So I've been very lucky in the sense that in as much as people have gone, come and gone, mm-hmm. some people have really been loyal and have stayed with us um, for a long time. So it's not about me. It's the, uh, I try to... To, to say that my job is really about managing managers. So you, if you're lucky enough to get a good manager to run something, and your job is just say, have you, have you done X, have you done Y? So that is really the key, and, and the rest is really a matter of uh, faith, uh, which, which I often talk about. And if you stay faithful with your people, if you m- assume that if they make mistakes, these mistakes were not, these are mistakes and they can be corrected, and their mistakes which have nothing to do with issues of integrity mm. because when it is an integrity issue yeah i am ruthless i don't tolerate yeah. this <laughs> but if it's just genuine mistakes which everybody does you want to be forgiving and let people 
uh, self-correct and, and, and carry them on with them. So it's been a combination of that and a willingness to keep uh, experimenting because we're constantly experimenting. That's why we're operating in different areas. Mm. There's, uh, there's just uh, a childlike curiosity where we're constantly experimenting. For instance, we're right now working on setting up an agency a division of our, our property company mm -hmm. because we want to see we are also curious mm. and, and and just my curious nature wanted to know about software for instance uh. I had to read up a little bit knowing that I have a software developer coming so yeah. that the conversation can be can be uh, fruitful and beneficial so mm. it's really about keeping my curiosity going that's really the key mm. and that's, that's really a very interesting um, point that you, that you bring forth there and I think um, the people element I actually wanted to ask mm. also um, if a follow-up you know to that yeah um, you know obviously there's there's going to be some people who slip through the cracks yeah right? but um, how what kind of model do you use um, when deciding to um, um, hire especially the people that are going to be managing the people who are doing the work I, I, I don't have a particular formula. It's, it's more like a gut. Uh -huh. uh, we do have a system, obviously, we ask the question, uh -huh. experience, the X factor, how are you during the interview, and you know, do, do you have the academic qualifications? And then a lot of, a lot of it is luck, because sometimes you choose somebody who ticks all the boxes and they've got you know, uh, certificates, and then they bomb. Mm. And then you have somebody yeah. who's mediocre, but your gut tells you that this person is all right. Mm. And they turn out to be an asset. Yeah. So I, I can't say that there's a fixed set of rules. And yeah. <laughs> okay. You yeah. see that camera over there? So uh -huh. You have to look at it and talk to that person. All leave right. them with something inspirational, after which you will tell them your contacts. Yeah. Um, you've got to love what you do. Um, it's, this is a quote that I got from Steve Jobs. You've got to love what you do because as an entrepreneur, it gets really difficult. You can imagine uh, the time that I was left with three pula in the company account, how the feeling must have been. You can imagine the time that we worked 20 hour days for months and didn't get paid, how the feeling must have been. And so in order to sustain and work through these difficult times, you've just got to love what you do. So my, I wouldn't say advice, but my takeaway in this life thing is, you've got to find, look, at, look for what it is you love to do and pursue it with everything you've got. Because you've got one life and you've got one shot, take it. Okay, contacts. Yeah. So uh, my contacts, uh, the first contact is my, my, my phone number. It's uh, 76. 779-112. Um, the Xavier Africa website is www.xavierafrica.com. And uh, if you'd like to shoot me an email um, or discuss more about digital transformation, uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn um, as well as on Twitter at uh, Tavonga Mukichuti. And uh, we'll definitely uh, have a discussion about that. All is passionate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant, Mr. Yes, uh, I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much.